Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I'm just going to give everyone a little second or two to come in. Sometimes it takes a little longer to log in, but welcome. Welcome to those who are just joining us now. We're just getting a few more people to join. We'll give them one more minute or so. Okay, I think we've got everybody here more or less. Um, so good afternoon everyone and welcome to our new Entrant Network webinar. Um, a warm welcome to those who have just joined us. Thanks for being here. My name is Larissa. Um, I'm part of the Investor Communications and Marketing team at Harman & Co. I'm very pleased to be welcoming you to our fourth new Entrant Network event, but our first webinar for our members. Um, for those of you who don't know, the new Entrant Network was founded two years ago. It's designed to support new or new-ish entrants to the EIS fund markets with insights, information, and valuable contacts from trusted advisors throughout our industry. So although we can't meet in person today, I do hope you'll find today both interesting and valuable, um, and that you'll use the contacts within the network um, in the next few days and weeks to come. So from Harman & Co, we're delighted to see the continued growth in membership and investment interest in the EIS sector. And that continues to, to fuel discussions and panel talks like the one we're having today. So a special thank you ahead of time to all our speakers and to those involved in contributing. Um, I'm gonna hand over to Martin Fox, who's Managing Director of Bulletin Marketing and also Chair of the EISA Committee for the Research, Education, and marketing of EIS. He'll explain how the webinar is going to work and introduce all our panelists. So Martin, over to you. Larissa, thank you very much indeed for that. And can I offer my own thanks to Hardman and the team that have put this event together. It's been terrific. My thanks too to Paul Richardson of the Share Centre, whose enthusiasm for this event and how it was put together has been uh, very encouraging, but thanks Paul. Um, we asked the, our audiences who are watching now what they would like this webinar to cover. We had a number of very good ideas, but the overriding one was a, for a discussion on what is needed to get investors in EIS to start investing again. Um, and of course, supporting good young companies. And today we have four, dare I say, distinguished panelists who are prepared to put their neck on the line and answer that question. Um, let me explain one other thing. We have asked attendees before the event for their questions that I'd like answered. Um, but there's the facility as well. If things occur to you as you watch to add um, your own questions, please use the Q&A button and um, we will try and um, answer your questions as we go through. But now let's introduce the panellists. Um, um, in alphabetical order, we've got Richard Angus from Harden & Co. We have Lawrence Gosling, who is the editorial director of What Investment. He actually created the Tax Efficiency Awards when he was at Investment Week and is a frequent business anal analyst for the BBC. Stephen Jones is the managing director of Clear Solutions Wealth and Tax Management and a board member of ESA. And Chris Sanfield uh, of, um, is CEO of, of Co-Investor. Um, and they're also running a very welcome transparency project for the EIS industry which I'm also very grateful for. What I've done is to ask each of them to speak for just a couple of minutes initially, giving their perspective on what they, they think is needed to restore confidence in EIS investing and to get investors investing again. So Richard, can we start with you and get your perspective on this? Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Before I start, there's a lot of feedback. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, so Martin, thank you very much for agreeing to chair this uh, new Entrant Network um, session. Um, before you even knew who the panelists were, I think it was extraordinarily brave and um, 
I would never have done it, but it's very kind of you to do it. It's also uh, very kind of Larissa and um, Emily to have set this up from Harbin & Co's point of view, done a great job. So I'm gonna answer your question now. I think in two minutes, I think the issue is all about communication. And I think it's about disseminating information that's appropriate on a timely manner to the right people. So let me explain where I'm coming from. Um, we're all disorientated at the moment. So we have managers, we have um, advisors, we have investors and we have companies. They're the sort of the micro uh, system that we work in and they're all disorientated through no fault of their own. If you're in the public markets, at least you have the um, ability to see what's going on. You have the ability to possibly trade and you feel you might have some handle on emotion. But the emotions in this market are very reflective of what's going on in the public market except you have a decision as an EIS investor whether to invest or stop investing. You can't really do very much else in the short term. And I think it's fair to say that the industry is in part, partly in sus, uh, suspended um, animation at the moment and we need to get clarity restored. And the only way to do that is for, in my view, is for the managers who are in the middle of the whole of this network. They're between the buyers, who are the investors and the advisors and the sellers, essentially, who are the companies, to basically start thinking, how do I communicate clearly to restore confidence? We've no idea whether this is going to be a short term or a longer term issue from the pandemic. But the point about it is that we have some great companies in this country. They desperately need funding on a continual basis. And we need to basically help everybody, including the advisors, as well as the investors, understand what is the fair value of these companies. And I might talk about it later, but the um, International Private Equity Guidelines, IPEB Guidelines, came out with a statement on the 30th, 31st of March, which basically said price of recent investment, i.e. the last funding round, may have no bearing whatsoever on the current value of a business. It may or it may not. It should be examined. And I think that's a good starting point because there are three sorts of companies in this world. There are companies that are actually probably see themselves as beneficiaries of this crisis. And that's not just life science companies, it's tech companies, communication companies, infrastructure. There's a load of companies that see, are, are being perceived as being winners. And you can see in the US stock market where that is. There are a number of companies who can see their way through a few months of dislocation. It just changes their trajectory, but they're not financially challenged. And I think this is the big issue. You've got companies that three or four months ago were priced for success, and now they're basically being priced for survival. In other words, their cash resources are depleted, and they don't know what to do. And if you look in the newspapers, you'll see Scottish Mortgage has taken down its private uh, valuations 20%. You'll see there's more ongoing problems um, in valuing companies between Link and Schroders, who took over the, uh, the uh, Woodford Patient Capital Trust. So there's a lot of indigestion out here, but at the end of the day, the investor wants to know where he stands. And the only way he can know where he stands is if he has good information. And then he'll start looking around the network and seeing whether people agree or disagree with him. And that's when the crowd psychology comes back in and the focal length of the market expands. So in two and a half minutes, Martin, that is a summary of my 45 minute speech last night. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, Lawrence, what would you like to say now to build on that? To build on that, um, I think many of the points that, that Richard makes are absolutely spot on. I mean, communication, I, I'm a kind of journalist. We're in the, in theory, in the, in the, um, uh, in the world of communication. The, the thing that's always fascinated me about um, EIS in particular is the uh, disconnect between um, the tax benefits and the investment benefits. The clue should be in the name, Enterprise Investment Schemes. And yet, in my experience, the vast majority of kind of managers and advisors talk about the tax breaks. Um, and with all due respect to anybody who's listening who may or may not be an accountant, tax is pretty boring, um, you know, um, but investment is not. And again, it feeds very much to the kind of what Richard was talking about. In a sense, there's a, there's a very serious point to, to valuations having changed so much in sort of six months. And that's important because for those people, whether they be um, uh, closed ended funds or individuals, the investment bit is what really ultimately kind of drives many of them. So I think, you know, the big challenge for the industry, even after 26 years, actually, is to make people understand it's an investment first and foremost. And then I think there's a longer term cultural issue that, um, 
in this country, we're not very good at valuing entrepreneurship. Um, we, I think in many ways we couch entrepreneurship and this is where the media, uh, I think has got a big part to play in terms of how much money somebody is worth as a result of being an entrepreneur. And again, it's quite, quite interesting to see how um, for the last 30 years, you know, Richard Branson has largely been lauded for being a billionaire. And yet when um, the, the airline that perhaps uh, has his name uh, partly on it or his, his, his brand's name on it wants a bailout, suddenly we don't like entrepreneurs. So I think longer term, I think there's a discussion to be had by, by the nation um, and in particular the industry to um, reposition what being an entrepreneur is about um, and why it's actually an incredibly laudable and important thing to, uh, to, to grow the nation the nation's um, employment, uh, the nation's tax take, and, and ultimately the, the, the wealth of the individuals behind it. Well, I think that's a great point, actually, about entrepreneurship. Thank you. Um, really helpful. Stephen, your turn now. Can we unmute? Sorry, you can hear me now. I can, I can um, hear you, Stephen. Okay. I'm going to just demonstrate that all advisors by definition of professional schizophrenics, in as much that we approach our viewpoints from the personal view as a professional advisor, but also, of course, trying to reflect our clients' wishes and desires. So picking up a couple of the points, um, Richard spoke about communication. I would break that down into saying that communication, I completely agree, is essential, but we see problems in terms of the transparency of the communication. Simply having a communication in itself isn't enough, but the, the ease at which we can access information about firms that we recommend to clients is so important to us. If you make the job difficult, that makes it very um, awkward for us and very awkward for our clients. So if it's not easy for us to get information and stuff from you, that's very, very difficult. The frequency of it, is also important. Too much, we switch off. Too little, we have the problems. And the consistency of it, we want it in a way that we can disseminate it to clients very, very Now that is, I just want there's a tremendous push now by many ERS providers to have some useful. Um, but I was going to really try and pick up another one where we're talking about restoring confidence. We want that story to come across because Lawrence spoke about um, investment as the exciting, sexy part, and it is. Clients have invested in these funds, not really. There are a few exceptions, not really because of the tax, that might interest them originally, but then they're interested in what they're investing in. And they want to hear about the story and they want to be engaged. And we have found for us that our clients who don't get that continual reminder about the story and what they've invested in, they become detached, removed, when, uh, as often happens, EIS um, investing companies come back and say, can we have some more money? The ones who keep us informed and keep the client engaged tend to do better. Stephen, thank you. Um, I, I think spot on as well. Um, can I just hasten to it? I didn't know what people were going to say at this stage. So um, it's good to hear. Thank you. Chris, it's your turn now, once you've unmuted yourself. Not to try and embarrass yourself right at the start. Um, well, you know, the co-investor, co we, we we run the platform, so we, we have the we have the the pleasure of of dealing with all with all part with all sides of the market, whether it's the investors, the companies, or the funds themselves. Um, and you know, I think I, I think more than anything, I agree I agree with with what everybody else said. You know, I think Stephen, quite interesting that look, people do invest in the story, um, and that that story needs to be ongoing. But you know, ease and transparency and frequency. Um, and consistency are not all bywords of the tax efficient sector. Um, if, if nothing else, that's that's an oxymoron within within the tax efficient sector. And you know, I think what we what we really need, you know, to, to answer your question specifically, um, you know, I, I'm not so sure, Richard, whether companies were priced for success and now they're priced for survival. And I, I think that's one of the issues. Is that, that without the transparency and without a, without a consistent framework and modeling and whether there is a benchmark from which you can use some form of independent framework to, to manage the information that you're getting, 
Um, I don't I don't yet think businesses are priced for survival or if they are there is no way the investor knows that because there, there, there isn't that transparent framework it's at the moment it's still quite hard to disseminate in, in, in not all but in many instances the individual portfolio companies and the transactions that have gone on within within them and actually what is what, what is the sort of fair market value of these investments um, and you know, we, we see that on our platform and we're trying, we're trying to work with other independent parties to, to try and build that framework. But at the end of the day, if you're an investor, what's to stop you waiting 12 weeks? Because what I do know is that whatever, whether you're priced for survival or not, the, the, company, the company that is asking for cash is going gonna, is gonna, is gonna to be at a cheaper price in 12 weeks, 12 weeks time than it is today. And there's no... The, 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 there is, there's not enough transparency or ongoing dialogue to understand this is when we should be investing in the company. It should be now. I shouldn't wait another 12 weeks because it may not be here or the damage may be too great and actually the risk would increase. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, on, ongoing dialogue with the fund managers needs, needs to happen and needs to be more consistent so that you can put that into some form of story as well. But you know, I, I think we're in danger of the market stopping and it not really starting again because everything's going to get cheaper. Um, and I think it's, it's for, the whole, for the whole marketplace to kickstart that again um, and have, have a more consistent framework and some sort of fair market value mechanisms for the individual portfolio holdings within, within, within their funds themselves. Artie, could I, can I come in in a minute if, yeah. when Chris has finished? Yeah, Sorry, yeah, Chris. Please, please come in now, Lawrence. I find a... I said my table yeah, thumping a bit. I mean, to which, which the answer, Robert, is absolutely you can, yes, although there are a couple of questions on, on fair value later on, but do go ahead, please. Well, I think, I mean, you know, given, given Chris is, is very, you know, lead, leading the, the projects on transparency for ESA, he's in a good position to, to, to comment. But I think, you know, the, the, the Richard's starting point is, is absolutely spot on. I remember a business that, uh, that, that I saw back in January that um, that was was valued at 26 million quid, and then um, you know, guess what? Come the end of March, it was valued at a million. Now, if I was an investor in that, and I'd had no communication in that three month period, I would go as many private investors do with the stock market. They don't understand how it works, but at least with the stock market, they can see a set of daily prices. As an investor in that private company, now worth 25 million pound less than it was three months earlier, I'd go. I don't understand that something sounds wrong now the answer is you know as we all know we're in the industry so we understand essentially valuation is not particularly scientific in a lot of in a lot of cases it's what was the last valuation round at hence that's the present value that you know and i think to, this is the point that sort of hardman makes i would say very well that there actually needs to be an independent uh, assessment of what value is within uh, either an overall portfolio with an individual portfolio company and I think this li leads to Chris's broader points about transparency so that it then means everybody who's coming into a, either a portfolio or investment or a single company um, has got somewhere independently to sort of check and, and sense test whether they're they're buying in at the top of the market the bottom of the market or there is going to be no market at all. Lawrence, that's really helpful. And um, Richard, you might like to come back to that a bit later on when the, the questions arise rather than now. Um, so thank you all for your two minute pitch, each, which is, uh, I think, really helpful in setting the scene. Um, can I just say, before we ask people to answer the specific questions that people, the audience have raised, <coughs> there were several questions about the lack, a perceived lack of government support for EIS companies. Uh, in, in the government response to lockdown. Can I just say, I don't want to get too sidetracked on this, but I have had several um, conversations with Mark Brownridge at ESA about this. And the, the points that he wanted to make were this. First of all, changes in tax relief require new legislation. And in the overall scheme of things, um, it was seen as taking too long or not of immediate priority. And he also made the point that we are also still governed by EU state aid restrictions. And we are until we completely come out of the EU. And so in many ways, I guess, the government took an easier option and came out with the Futures Fund, which is not compatible with EIS. Um, we could debate the rights and wrongs of that for a long time, but there's other more, um, I think, valuable questions to be discussed today. Can I just say that Mark is in regular contact with the Treasury every week and is still pushing 
the case for more to be done. Lawrence, I don't, you're a commentator on things like this. I don't, I don't yeah. Know yeah. That. Well, I think it's a really interesting point, and I saw and was, uh, um, am aware that a number of people within the industry were sort of essentially lobbying the government to um, either extend tax breaks, widen them, change the um, end of the tax year for in, in terms of uh, contributions to EIS based investment. Um, all of which I think is in, in the current crisis we've found ourselves in is um, would have been politically completely unacceptable. Um, you know, I think the, what the government has done broadly to support SMEs uh, with various kind of um, loans, et cetera, et cetera, is probably a more um, more even handed way of giving government support at a time like this. And there is there is a danger. And, um, you know, um, I hear Stephen's point and he's kind of right. Most people, while they hear about the tax breaks, um, you know, that's not ultimately why they stay in it. But there is a perception outside the industry that um, EIS is just about tax breaks for high net worth individuals. Now, again, um, I would, you know, I'd balance that up. And I often do say it to private investors who read my magazine. That's not actually the case. Ultimately, you know, any of us can invest in, in um, uh, you know, in EIS. And I don't think any of us here consider ourselves to be a high net worth individual. Um, so I think from the government's perspective, they, they couldn't really be seen to do anything on, on the, on, on, from a tax perspective. And I don't think there was any great reason to specifically support EIS, CDIS, or even VCT backed investments in the, in the sort of current climate. Um, there might be in, you know, in a budget next year sometime, but I think in the current um, situation we find ourselves in, I don't. And actually, if you extrapolate forward and take the economic scenario that, that may well be as bad as, as many people sort of predict, I don't think that's going to be a solution um, to help grow the industry in the next 12, 12 to 18 months. Lawrence, thank you. And again, very good to have that wider perspective. OK, let's um, open up to some, to some real live questions now that, that came in over the last week or two. I mean, there is no doubt that the industry had a shock in March. It was expecting a, a big chunks of investment to come in and then suddenly new investments dried up. Um, why did the business get pulled so quickly in March? And perhaps I could ask um, either Stephen to answer that and or Chris, um, both of which are at the sharp end of, of um, talking and, and with clients. Um, I'll give a very short answer to that. Um, we had clients who just said, is there any reason why we should not pull our investment at the moment? Are the prices likely to go up? And I couldn't see a reason why they couldn't defer their investment. Um, because we simply didn't believe that existing direct investments were going to refuse the money to later stage. And there's a good chance that we could go back and get a better deal. So it's that twofold whammy of clients are um, lost confidence and the cameo ones going, can we strike a better deal later? So in the majority of cases, I don't think the money has gone away permanently, but it has been deferred. Okay, thank you. Chris, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd put a slight, slightly bigger sort of broader macro slant on that just by, by having spent a lot of time in, in the financial markets previously to, to, to the sort of platform world. Um, you know, I, I, think, I think when the macro when the macro picture um, suddenly looks very choppy and you just don't, you just don't really know what's on the horizon, then, you know, you get, you get investment behavior where, where it's, it's a risky investment. And I don't know, I don't, these are very illiquid investments and I'm actually unsure of my own financial situation over the next three to five years. If I'm watching the world catch fire, um, then my, my money may be better kept under the bed. Um, than in, you know, locked up, locked up for five years in an investment, and sort of compound that with with Stephen's comments about why shouldn't I defer and is the price likely to be cheaper? I don't know why anyone did invest. Um, and, you know, I think I think the the critical point of what what do we do to get people to invest now? You know, we you know perhaps perhaps, and I don't want. To, well, if you get egg on, on my face, it doesn't matter. Perhaps the world isn't ending. Um, but how, how do we get that investment behavior to now, to now start to want to invest again? You know, some of, some of these companies were good companies before COVID. Some of, the, some of them will still be good companies after COVID. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a 
I'm a real supporter of entrepreneurs and the whole process and getting liquidity to these companies when, when they need them. That's almost part of the ethos of, of EIS and other tax efficient investments. We are definitely not giving, giving money to the companies when they need them, which is right now. And then we have to ask, ask, ask ourselves, if we are getting a little bit more transparency on the on you know a little bit clearer horizon shall we say whether whether there's a second sort of down whether there's a second downtrend from a macroeconomic perspective or not um you know some of these companies have survived a pretty horrific sort of three or four months of no funding and and some fairly strong headwinds you know they deserve some investment and ultimately you know the, the fund managers need to have a look at look at how you know what is the story now if the story's changed from january to march what is what is the new story now for these companies and um what should what should that price be um and you know what's the likely dilution going forward as well because these things aren't always very clear as well in in you know in the life cycle of an investment it's not normally one chunk of one tranche of money and that's it um, so I think it starts to get complicated and what we need is, you know, we need to simplify the message and simplify the investment life cycle. So actually someone understands when they're putting their money in what the likely risks are. Um, but, you know, some of these companies were good, were good companies before and they're still good companies. But we, we, we've yeah. got to get that money. We got that money. A lot of that money hasn't evaporated. It is sitting on the sidelines. But how do you move it off the sidelines and into the marketplace? Yeah, I mean, Chris, you, you, you raised a question that someone else asked as well, actually, at the same time, because it, the, the, the question was, when will an appetite return and what's worrying people now? And I think the issue is, what do advisors and investors need now that will help them start taking it seriously again and, and, and looking to invest again? And um, so we've talked about communication, but what information will make people change? I mean, as an example, um, there's a couple of managers I've been talking to recently where they're excited about what's happening and they're saying some of uh, the companies are going quote unquote gangbusters um, and there's new opportunities emerging. There's very nimble companies who, who are taking advantage of new opportunities. So there are some good news stories as well, but I'd like to sort of chat to each of you about what sort of information both investors and advisors need. Um, you know, what fears and concerns they have, but what do they need to make them say, okay, now's the time to start thinking again? Um, um, Chris, can I go back to you as a start? Because you're yeah, transparent. Uh, I think one of your, the interesting things is your transparency project, because I, I think that can only do very good for the industry if it's everything people feel clear and they know where they stand. And perhaps I could um, just flag one thing, a bit of a, an advertisement, but um, ESA working on um, a, a project to make fees much clearer for advisors as well and for clients, which will fit in very well with what you're doing on the transparency side. But mm -hmm. your, your thoughts, Chris? Yeah, well, I mean, just, just 30 seconds on the, on the transparency project, then, as you've, as you've mentioned it a couple of times, Martin. So what we're looking at doing is we're really doing this in, in a number of phases. Um, so phase one, first and foremost, we need transparency on fees. So as you mentioned, we're, we're working with, with um, ESO on, on, on building, building that sort of trispans, trispan, transparency framework. But I think more importantly, I think the next, the next level of information that, that investors should rightly have is the individual portfolio holdings um, and the transaction and price history of those. And that needs to be linked to, to Companies House, which is the, the, the framework we're currently building on our platform. Um, so, you know, I, I, think, I, think, I think that, you know, tra transparency is, is, is one thing, but, but, but you know, the, the specific question, what, what do advisors need and what investors need? I think that needs to come together with a broader, with a, with a broad intelligent framework. If you, look at, if you look at the public markets, there's an awful lot of research available. You can look at sort of three, five, 10 year outlooks and then build a sector comparison and understand what sectors are likely to perform or outperform over different, various different cycles within sort of the global super cycle. And if you think of the UK is, you know, we're a global business. We have, have a number of different sectors, which sectors are likely to perform over the next three to five years based on COVID as a bit of a disruptor, um, 
but you know some sectors are going to do materially well some sectors are actually quite nimble and a number of entrepreneurs have shown that certainly with the fund managers that i've been speaking to in recent weeks we did about some of their portfolio companies and they've, they've you know they've, they've they've done sort of very large pivots um to ensure their business survival um but i think all of that needs to come together and i think it needs to be independent so you know it's not a project that, that we want to do by ourselves it's you know it's by working with the likes of, of Hardman um, and by bringing the advisors um, in, into into the fray to sort of understand that we, we can give you this sector research we can then give you portfolio valuations and transparency on the fund managers and then engage the fund managers to give that ongoing storyline so that so the so that the investors feel comfortable but you know it, the advisors and the investors look at it slightly differently I think from a risk management perspective um but ultimately they're making the same type of investment into the same type of funds the advisors tend to shy away from the single company deals we found whereas the high net worth will um high net worth or any other eis investor is interested in those but i think ultimately what we need is a framework it's not beyond the wit of man these frameworks exist everywhere else in the world for all other types of investing we have to ask ourselves why why they don't invest yet here um we've got the we, you know co-investor sits here with technology we just need to bring the other with the other the other participants into that marketplace and get everybody's contribution and i think that independence is is really important thank you for that very much richard can i call invite you back now because um not just in the conversation of the last few minutes but a couple of other questions have been about the valuation and pricing of companies and getting fair value in um today's market so that and I guess it's partly achieving that and partly communicating it because the good people don't know about it. It's very hard to make a, an educated decision. So your views, please. Okay, so let's frame it like the answer like this. In normalized expansionary times, there is com capital competing for the very best companies. So you can get a clearing price in the market simply because you have a number of people looking to take positions in a number of companies. And that's considered to be a fair value because it is essentially as close as you can get to a real market price. Um, the issue with the, um, in the private equity guidelines is that in 2018, in December, they basically issued a warning saying, don't stretch this too much and play around with this um, parameter for fair value. And what I mean by that is when you've done a fundraise, how long do you get before you are you run out of a period of grace? So you you invest, so you raise money for a reason or a number of reasons, and those num those reasons are trackable. But often companies haven't been held to account, and what happens next is they start running out of money. People don't quite know how the managers don't quite know how to handle the situation. They've got a fundamental issue. They've got a cash flow issue, and you get lots of other issues now in the world we're in now, where there's far less money going into these positions, these companies you have a different approach. You have to rely on much more theoretical modeling and um, financial analysis to try to come up and manufacture what you think is a fair value. And the, and the guidelines are perfectly clear and there's, it, this is nothing new. It's a question of how you apply them and you've got to apply them with a certain degree of, of uh, subjectivity as well. Um, I mean, we've, we came up across a company recently which three months ago was in fantastic shape, apparently. When we actually looked at the company and we looked at the board minutes, we found actually there was a lot of discord. And then we looked again and we found actually from being a very cash catch rich, rich company, they actually had 800 pounds in the bank. Now, this wasn't in an EIS fund, so we're not talking about a, a position that we are um, anywhere uh, close to, but it gives you a very good example of what's happening. And the issue is, if you can't understand what, how, to, how to agree the rules of fair value pricing, then you've got a problem. So it's a bit like us all deciding to play football and we all agree how big the pitch is and we're going to abide by the rules. At the moment, um, there's a lot of stale valuations out there. And those stale valuations have been um, increased, I think, by obviously the pandemic and people need to start looking at them. So to answer your question, Martin, about what information is needed, if I'm an investor, now today i would like to know what the balance sheet of my company looks like the one i'm investing in or preparing to invest in i would like to know if the fundamentals have changed as a result of covid positively or negatively i would like to know um, whether the timeline to recovery 
assuming that most companies have been put through um, a, a period of pressure? How long is that? How, how will they recover? How long will it take? And then I'd like to actually look at the valuation. So it staggers me, it absolutely staggers me that people start producing models to us with completely unrealistic cost of capital calculations that justify a higher price than, than really should be justified in the real world. And in an up market, you can get away with the, the tides rising. So valuations rise, everybody's looking at each other, it seems to be going up. So I'm fine, I'm in bed with the right people, so to speak. And we're not in that, we're not in that world anymore. So we were phoned up by a company who asked for a valuation. And we didn't understand why until we realized there was only one investor of a whole raft of shareholders who were prepared to put money in and they had no way of working out how to value that business and so we i'm not saying we came up with the right answer but we came up with an independent perspective for them which hopefully was useful and it's very very tricky but you don't want to go too close to financial modeling you have to look at start looking at the real world as soon as possible comparable valuations of real companies but we are in a very difficult position because as i said when i started we are all basically dislocated Richard, can you provide that information simply rather than create another problem for investors to think about Did yes you? fine yeah the, the, uh, the answer yeah. This, this is not this is not unbelievable and what you actually should do if i were running money i would um running funds which is what you do in the uh, in the in the quoted space i would actually have a proactive monitoring system on how companies are progressing what i think has happened in many cases in the past is that it's not been transparent enough to investors that that actually has been the case and one of the other reasons for saying that is if you're reg regularly raising money every six to nine months or every year as a company the market price sort of takes care of itself. The fair value price takes care of itself because you're always raising more money. This doesn't occur when things have slowed. This doesn't happen when things have slowed down because the incidence of fund of fundraises becomes far more spread out. And then there's another point here which we haven't addressed at the moment, but I think companies need to know what they're worth in the new world as opposed to what they think they're worth. And that's why I talk about price for survival. We've heard about companies who just basically still think they're worth more than they were six months ago because they are, and that's not the case. And if they don't understand that, it's the Dragon Den situation. How do you actually ever get a trade completed? So you do need an investor who agrees, I think this is an accessible risk reward situation. But if the price doesn't actually coincide with what the company wants to pay, wants to receive, there's no trade, is there? And I sometimes companies have a real problem understanding this and it ends up being funded 11th hour funding and the whole thing becomes very distasteful and okay. so it's an education for companies as well as investors. Richard thank you very much. Stephen you've been sitting there very patiently listening to Chris and Richard from an advisor perspective do you agree with what they've been saying? Yes but um, where I was going to add to that is that an advisor is probably the one who's most removed in terms of the intelligence that Chris and Richard can apply. So as an advisor, if, uh, and I would split it into two parts, existing funds who are coming for more money. So we've already got clients invested in them and new entrants to the space. And we would treat, in both cases, I would now automatically expect there to be a revaluation or another assessment by a third party team of analysts because there are far too many funds that would come to me as an advisor representing clients, expecting me to be able to do all of my own due diligence. And only speaking for our firm, we do do due diligence on every firm. And as a very quick plug, Martin, you touched on the transparency project. The other thing you didn't mention was that ESA are also doing um, all the work, as you're aware, on a new standardized due diligence format that we want all EIS funds to complete, which we're hoping will make everybody's life a great deal easier. But even allowing for that project, which is currently underway, as a firm, we would automatically request and not put clients in, unless they've got it, a third party analyst's assessment. So that supports everything that Richard and Chris have been talking about because they've got that resource to provide it. And I certainly, even for an existing fund, would require that now because too much has changed. I want the reassurance that that fund has been assessed. So we talk about the cash runway, which is the phrase used extensively in this space. Uh, I want to know that they're not so desperate for the cash, they're gonna die next month if they don't get this investment. Um, and also you've already seen the change because a phone call I had earlier today 
it was from uh, somebody in this space and they've slashed their entrance costs um, for an existing fund. Uh, and they've been absolutely fr upfront about it. They've got very good reasons and I'm perfectly happy with that. They've said what they're trying to achieve. They said we're going to take a, a hit on some of our charging structure to encourage you to invest. And what's wrong with that? Yeah, fair enough. Lawrence, you've been very patient and very quiet. Um, <laughs> From a you know your point of view and the media, yeah. Um, what do you think that people should be talking about now to, to build bring back that confidence? Well, I think um, <clears throat> one thing that uh, is always comes to my mind. S Stephen has mentioned it particularly from from his perspective as an advisor on behalf of his clients is trans transparency about fees. Again, if we look at other investment. Uh, uh, propositions in the market that advisors and private clients use. So open-ended funds, OICs, and investment trusts. Um, I'm not going to. I'm not going to tell you the, the the simplest things to understand. But basically, the charging structure is, is reasonably obvious to people on one quick look. And clearly, there are obviously hidden issues that are, you know, not immediately obvious. But so I, th I think you know. Again, Stephen said it, and he's absolutely right. There needs to be an absolutely standard across the board industry. Um, set of uh, set of charges that everybody knows is there um, because there's too many sort of hidden charges that become egregious on things so that's kind of first and foremost um, and I think trying to, um, to, to to take it forward to sort of build confidence I think it's two things I actually don't think there's a lack of confidence um, generally in, in EIS I think there's just a, a lack of confidence broadly in investing Although I slightly disagree with sort of Chris at the moment, if if I'd had the money, um, I I would have actually said this um, this tax year, the, the one that's just finished and the one that's just started, is a wonderful opportunity to have invested. I probably would have invested in a, a portfolio of very good life sciences biotech businesses um, that were probably quite um, fairly uh, fairly valued at the time, and suddenly now because they've all seemed to have found a link with COVID nineteen. Um, I'm not entirely sure how um, how legitimate that is, but anyway, they're certainly using it. Um, I'd suddenly be sitting there going, "Oh, how clever am I? I've just got in um, uh, close to the bottom of a sector." So, um, but kind of more seriously, I think taking taking EIS um, back to where I sort of started uh, our whole conversation today, out of a little bit of a niche and just actually remarketing it as um, uh, as an investment proposition for a a broader set of, of, of private investors. So, you know, I've made a couple of EIS investments myself. Uh, one worked quite well, one worked terribly. It was busted within months and one is still limping along. Now, um, I've actually, I enjoy all three of those investments. Um, you know, I might just, if I'm lucky, get back the, the sum total of all three of them, the one that if it carries on a little bit further. But I think just, you know, Broaden out the appeal of EIS uh, away from being for high rate taxpayers to a broader invest, investor base. Richard looks like he's about to jump in. He had, he I, say yeah, I, I tell you why, because the thing that concerns me is that, as we know, there's less money going in. What chance the new brand new companies of getting are getting funded when clearly managers who have got cash are likely to support the companies they already invest in and i'm just wondering how much of a problem that actually is and well yeah actually richard if i can ask you a question i don't know whether it was directly to me and i'm sure the other guys have got something to contribute on this but i think it's a really really fair point if i'm running a portfolio and we all know we've all listened to propositions from uh portfolio propositions where a manager will say look you know i expect two or three to go bust and i expect two or three to get my money back and i hope to get you know, two or three big winners. If if that balance of winners versus losers has moved to six, might go bust. If I don't support the three that are, you know, somewhere in the middle, then I think you know, in instinct, human nature would say they're going to support the existing businesses. And to your point, the um, uh, the businesses that miss miss out are the newer ones that may well be in this current environment, but the ones that are actually got the better or a different long term investment proposition. I, I think that I've heard that issue, um, you know, from other from other people, Lawrence. To what extent should investors be told where the money is going? In that case, 
Well, I think, you know, um, the, the one thing that um, all, all five of us on the call are agreed on, and I, I think everybody who's listening in would be, uh, would be transparency, the need for greater transparency. So again, if I'm an investor in a portfolio, um, or even if I'm in a single company, I want to know where my money is going or has gone. Uh, and I want to be able to keep track of that very, um, very clearly. And that, again, to the point I think Stephen's made very, very well in particular, and, and Chris has said, it's not always that easy to find out. Um, and again, yeah. it, it just, in, in a sense, it actually, um, the, for failing to do that, it actually throws the entire industry under, yes. you know, a little bit of a shroud. And look, I'm a journalist, you know, half of what journalism is about is finding bad news and sharing it with the world. Um, yeah. it, it, you know, it, it, that that is the fact. And actually, what's, what's the other half, Lawrence? Uh, the other the other <laughs> half is to do with um, the other half to do, Chris, is um, what uh, what, what uh, silly little new remedy is going to make us all live a lot longer. <laughs> No, Lawrence, I do share your concerns actually for the industry. If if now the industry gets this wrong, so I, I think it's a point very well made. Look, all of you have talked about the importance of communications, and some of you at least are recipients of communications. I'd love to know your thoughts on best practice because, Stephen, I think you mentioned that um, you don't want to be inundated um, and get too much or too little. Um, we're probably all getting zoomed out. Um, so what is best practice in, in, in your perspective in the right level of communications? Well, I think there's the potential for an enormous benefit for the industry what we're currently going through. Um, and that is because everybody who's involved in the sector is used to hundreds of face-to-face -face meetings. And you talk to any um, provider in the EIS space, they, if they want to break into this market, they've almost got to face an awful lot of glad handing and coffee meetings and things like that to try to get their message across. We've all seen a phenomenal growth in the use of Zoom or Microsoft Teams and things like that. So I think that if there's any provider out there listening to this, you have no excuse but to be fantastic at presenting your pitch deck on this type of forum. So you talk about best practice. I love it when I've agreed to listen to a particular third party and they A, send me the pitch deck in advance, preferably by at least 48 hours in advance, so I've got a chance to scan it, because that means I'm not trying desperately to think on my feet with intelligent questions, because I don't have time to do an awful lot of follow-up. I need that information in advance to get my thoughts together, to start getting my questions together, and then I want them to convey above all else the passion for the project that they are presenting. Because if they're not enthusiastic, it's not my job to, to give that enthusiasm to my clients. So if they don't believe in what they're telling me, then sure as hell nobody else is going to do that for them. So information in advance, a really effective pitch deck, and enthusiasm and passion with very, very clear explanations. And the old adage of do what you said you were going to do. So if somebody says they're going to come back to me with some answers on particular points, do it in a very, very quick, timely fashion. If you can't be bothered to do that, then you've probably blown your chance with me in the first place. I think very succinct and spot on. Thanks ever so much. Anyone else want to comment on their preferred preferences for um, receiving communications? Yeah, I mean, if, if, if I may, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to be biased here, but, you know, I, I guess, you know, the, uh, the, the team at Co-Investor have you know, spent four years building a marketplace and I think it'll be interesting to see what type of behaviour, you know, there is going to be an adjustment of behaviour coming out of this, you know, hopefully finally technology is getting some use rather than being sworn at, which is what seems to have happened for the last decade. Um, but, you know, I, I, I do think that a marketplace where advisors and investors can, can communicate and share information with fund managers you know, the efficiency is huge for everybody because, you know, Stephen mentioned, you know, the amount of meetings that fund managers and advisors have to do, and it's just not necessarily an efficient way of working, but I appreciate it's a very human way of working. But, you know, if, 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 if the situation over the last three months has taught us anything, it's taught us actually that we can communi communicate over these, over these types of mediums. And, you know, I'm, I'm very excited to understand what, what something like our platform will look like in six, nine, 12 months time, by trying to bring all of that, all of the different elements of the investment community together, along with 
um, you know, high quality independent research and investment frameworks and fair value, fair value sort of frameworks as well. So, I mean, it's an incredibly biased answer, but I am an incredibly biased person. I think, you know, I think, I think a digital marketplace is, is the way to go. And all you've got to do is look outside to understand that that's probably a sensible answer right now as well. Uh, it's interesting because one of the other questions asked here was what changes to the industry that are happening now do you see us having long-term benefits so mm. i think that is one of the things there and i don't know if other people have other comments around that as well yeah Ma martin i've got i mean i i would uh, it goes back to something stephen said quite early i'd like to see kind of regular standardized reporting on um, individual companies or sort of portfolios and i'd like to see it very timely after the end of a quarter yeah. You know, the, the unit trust industry for all its size still sends clients, you know, half yearly reports to about three months down the line. So if you, you know, if you've got one telling you evaluation at the end of February, you, you were feeling rather smug. And by the time you actually received it and you can't blame the postman for this, you know, your money's worth a third less. I think, you know, in the sector we're talking about now, given a lot of management groups talk about how close they are with their underlying investee businesses. Well, if they are really close, um, they should be able to jot down you know, 100 words once a quarter on what company X is doing. Uh, and what, again, I think Stephen's point about passion is a great one. Um, you know, why they still really believe in this business. And then perhaps, you know, three or four times a year, if there is an independent valuation along the lines of the stuff that, that Richard is talking about. So I, as an investor or an advisor, I can see great there's something really going on with this business and by the way I know independently what it's worth and it's just an openness and I think an honesty as well you know in this space nobody expects everything to go right but for some management groups um, you, when you talk to them it sounds like every investment they've ever made um, is, um, is an outrageous success and you know what guess what it's not true. Yes thank you. Richard you looked like you wanted to say something just now. No I'm okay I'll, I, I think that's that point's actually been uh... Been coming. Okay, can I just can I just say one thing? So I don't yeah, want to come across that you know it's, uh, uh, and I don't know. I'll, I'll reflect, but hopefully none of us are coming across particularly as fund fund manager bashing. I think, I think you know the the, the fund management companies are set up, and they you know they you know resource is not is not a huge element to them, and and either the same as everybody else. And any any efficient company shouldn't have over resource anyway by the very nature of it. And I think. I think really it's just about you know bringing all of the parties together and understanding look, how, what, what information can we provide? Can we provide it regularly? Can we provide it efficiently? And can it can it be independently certified? Because I think if we can do that, then then everybody will want to, nearly everybody will want to do so. Certainly everybody you want to invest in will want to provide that information. You know, I meet mean, some absolutely cracking fund managing fund manager companies out there. Some of them small, some of them early stage. Um, some of them larger, and some really, really exciting single company opportunities. Um, but none of them, I think, are particularly well resourced in dealing with advisors or, or, or investors. And I think it's really just trying to bring all of that together and, and to do it efficiently and, you know, it almost systematically. There may be a hundred words overlay from the fund manager, but what I really want is, is, is okay, give, give me that ongoing... Um, appraisal of, of, of how things how things are going and then give me a certain set of standardized information that I can look on quarter on quarter to really understand what's up you know what's happening in the business as well as the management overlay and you know there's some there's, as I say there's some amazing amazing investment opportunities out there and some great fund managers out there um, but but a lot of the time they're, they're as under resourced as everybody else um, so I think we just need to try and provide efficiency with regards to the transparency project we've been really really um impressed with actually how many fund managers want to be transparent the industry as, as Lawrence mentioned you know, has always been shrouded in a little bit of mystery and i think to a degree that's always been because no one's actually asked them or told them how to look under the bonnet or you know for, for stephen say look this is what i want to see under the bonnet please so you know there's 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 a bit of a bit of a hang up that a lot of these fund managers are being secretive on purpose I'm making this statistic up, but I, I would I would argue that actually 90% of them aren't being secretive on purpose. It's just no one's asked them the right questions, and you know for that the the rest of the industry also needs to stick its hand up. Yes, thank you very much, gentlemen. We are getting close towards the end. I'm conscious of time going by, and 
call for people's time. I'd like to cover very briefly just two one-line questions and get yes, no, whatever, and then I'm going to come back to each of our four guest panels and ask you in 20, 30 seconds what you think that is the key message that's for you that's come out of today. Um, I mean, Lawrence, on what the, can the media do, and Chris, what can the platforms do better, and Stephen, what would you welcome most from ask managers, and then Richard, what can the independent reviewers do to help more? But before we get there, um, question, does the panel think that interest in impact-driven startups will increase as a result of COVID-19? No, absolutely not. Fine. Anyone else going, going? Um, I, I think what I've been, what, what, what I'm seeing a little bit of an increase in, and we'll, we'll, we'll wait to see, is, is the overall ESG market rather than impact investing. I don't, I don't, I agree with Lawrence. I don't see impact investing as immediately flipped um into the sort of the the supporting you know the, the supporting investment but I, I am seeing a little bit of a little bit more traffic around this sort of esg and united nations principle of responsible investments and this sort of thing so i'm seeing a little bit more traffic around that which is really encouraging we've always we've always had yep. government um but if we can get the other two um from the acronym then you know i think that'll be a good thing but i, I don't see impact investing being the next bit the next big thing Cool. Just quick, Thank you. Martin, just quickly yep. to add, add to that, if the, if the government uh, uh, removes the sunset clause on social impact tax relief, which to date has been a very, um, almost like the poor relation of the tax efficient yes. world, then I think there's an opportunity, more projects, more funds will come to the market and then we, we might be able to see a genuine growth in it. But absolutely, I totally agree with Chris. We won't, um, it, we will in the sort of more mainstream ESG space where there is considerable fund flows into um, the OICs and investment trusts. Great, thank I, you. I, I agree with those comments. The impact investment space is too small. Yep. ESG, it's, it's a subset of the ESG space. Yeah, thank you, helpful. And um, what about, um, another question here, have custodians been able to operate at the same level during, um, I want any, to, imp any impact on level of service for custodians? Can I go on that? Because that was the topic I really wanted to cover in today's session. Because Fine, I, was, go. I was going to address that in several ones. I've never seen a market review of custodians and we, we deal directly with many custodians and the range and quality of the service we get from them ranges from fantastic to truly abysmal and I'm sure my dead dog could do a better job than one of them. So, <laughs> Absolutely, hear, hear. And more importantly, when people ask, you know, where are the fees that I'm, I'm paying to be part of this or any other investment goes and you have to explain about custodians, etc. I can't figure out, I've been in the industry a long time, I can't figure out what a custodian does to justify its money. Um, totally with Stephen on this one. I think Brilliant. there's a real call for some type of review, review and assessment. And I think it's important for the providers because they don't seem to know when I ask them, how did you end up picking one? And invariably, it's either because they know somebody else who uses them or because they're cheaper. Correct. Can I, can I, can I go slightly off panel here, actually? I, 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 I concur with, with an awful lot of that. Um, you know, for, for, for 18 months, we've been trying to get the custodians to build, uh, to enable us to use our technology for a digital straight food process for, for the investors. It's not rocket science. We've built this technology. It exists. We have it. Um, and there, there is, you know, you, you all know how slow custodians move with regards to adoption of technology. In their defense, what happened with, with a number of them is that they closed their post rooms. Um, and within within six weeks of, of COVID lockdown, we we We'd written the code, we'd built the straight through process, and we'd onboarded, I think, three, three custodians. So it shows that they can move quickly when, when needed. Um, so I think that was encouraging, actually, and hopefully we'll see a little bit more action from the custodians going forward. Um, but it, you know, it took COVID and the closure of their post, post rooms to adopt technology that's been in existence for, for 18 months. I think it's a good point. There's been a live question just thrown in. Who's the panel think is the best custodian then? Are you, are you prepared to answer that? Uh, not in public, no. Fine. Anyone want to? No, maybe not then. I'm, I'm, I'm independent, but I would only say that, you know, I think there's, there's three that have a digital straight through process on our platform. So, I, you know, I don't want to name names, but you know, I think there's three good ones. Okay, thank you. That's brilliant. Right, gentlemen, time to close. Um, 
you, your closing comments, please. Lawrence, do you want to go first on what can the media do to support the industry going forward? Yeah, I think um, it's a good question. I mean, this first thing, you know, the, the role of the media is never to um, promote or support anything. It's just to, in theory, to give a very balanced view of it. Um, and to do that, I think we need uh, better quality of information. We're, in many ways, we're much like the advisor community. Um, but, you know, the media exists perhaps more on stories. So we need better stories. We need honest and genuine stories um, that I do think celebrate um, real entrepreneurship, as I said at the kind of outset. It's been very noticeable. The industry's got a lot better in the last few months talking about businesses that it is supporting, has supporting, that is trying to combat some of the issues to do with uh, COVID-19. That's great. Um, but I come back to it, you know, successful entrepreneurship is not about the individual who makes him or herself uh, a millionaire. It's about what they contribute to the economy. So I think if we can have more stories celebrating the amount of tax, the amount of new jobs um, that a business backed by EIS or another tax efficient route um, is achieved, that's the kind of thing that we want to hear more about. I think that's brilliant. Thank you very much. Chris, platforms, your closing comment. Yeah, and I'll, 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 be, I'll be very brief. You know, I think, I think platforms need to do a better job of bringing, bringing everybody together. Ultimately, you know, we are a marketplace and what we need to do is service all, all elements of that. Um, and I think, you know, platforms can be in danger of running, running with the, slow, you know, the pace of the slowest operator within, within the platform. Um, and I think platforms perhaps need to take a little bit more courage and just press press on forward and deliver what what the advisors, investors, and fund managers want. So you know I think we, we're guilty of that as well sometimes. That custodian story is you know is 18 months and it took six weeks. So you know that that's not much fun for a platform either. But you know so I, I think I think platforms in general and and me and my team can can do a better job at trying to bring everything together, um, you know, all in one place. Thank you. Stephen? As much as it pains me to say this, I'm going to have to say I think the future is probably with intermediated platforms such as Joinvestor, Cuba, etc. Because this through um, put of information in a speedy, consistent, timely fashion, they've got the leverage to deliver that far more easily than the many, many smaller IFAs. I am, of course, also going to say the very large IFA firms probably can do that themselves. Um, but I think the key, as we've been talking about today, has got to be about giving us the information in a far more readily consistent format. And I think that message has come through clearly in this panel session. Thank you so much. And Richard, as the um, host, if you like, or, or uh, yeah, who, but people, person behind this, do you want to have, have the last word? Well, almost the last word. OK, so I think the word I'm going to come up with, um, and I haven't got approval from Larissa, so this is unusual. I'm going to come up with the word recalibrate. And I think basically what the research side can do is to help recalibrate expectations in the industry. And I think that's perfectly valid given what we've been through. And then the second part is the ongoing servicing. And I think portfolio monitoring services that can be designed to be easily explainable to investors on a regular but not too regular basis are probably the way forward. And um, these can be designed quite easily and fund managers can decide what is important to them and what is not relative to their audience, their investor audience, and also their companies as well. Richard, thank you. Right, in closing, can I just thank Hardman for putting this on? Um, can I pay a special thank you to all our panel? I think you've been tremendous. I've, I've actually learned a lot, which surprises me. Um, and, and thank you to the audience for spending time with us. It's much appreciated. And the webinar has been recorded. So if you want a, a, a copy to pass on to your colleagues, friends, or anyone else, please let Harpen know. But thank you ever so much for your time. Thank you. Yeah. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye.